Hello, this is Dr. Golding, and today we're going to talk about criticisms against Hobbes' theory of ethics. So, as you recall, Hobbes' theory is the social contract theory, and this is the idea that human beings in the natural condition would be living in a very miserable, awful situation, and using reason, we are able to figure out that we need to follow certain natural laws and remember the first natural law is seek peace and when that fails use all means of war at your disposal to defend yourself and promote your interests second of all the second natural law is that we should be willing to give up as much of our natural rights as we would wish other people to give up over us that is the essence of the second natural law and Hobbes says that in a way that kind of boils down to not doing unto others what you would not want them to do unto you and furthermore part of that second natural law is also that we should be transferring some of our natural rights to a governor or a ruler of some sort who is then going to enforce obedience to the natural laws upon us by threat of punishment and so we establish a government to rule over ourselves and the government has the right sort of invested by us in the government and that's kind of where we get the or at least we see here the idea that a government gets its authority to rule over the citizens from the citizens themselves and this was actually a fairly novel idea during that time because uh, until that time a lot of people would have said a lot of thinkers would have said that the king or the ruler does not get his authority to rule from the people rather he gets his authority to rule maybe from God or that's actually a theory called the divine right of kings uh, perhaps the king doesn't get his authority to rule from the citizens he just happens to be the ruler but according to Hobbes uh, a government gets its legitimacy to rule over the people from the citizens themselves because they are transferring as part of the social contract they are agreeing to give up some of their natural rights to the leader that they impose upon themselves so in any event that's the social contract theory in a nutshell we've already talked about that today we're going to talk about some criticisms against Hobbes's theory and I'm going to give you three criticisms my favorite number is three so we're going to have three criticisms against Hobbes now maybe there's more than three that one can think of but Today we're going to talk about three criticisms against Hobbes' social contract theory. So here's number one. I'm going to put on the board a little slogan and then I'll explain what it means. Here's criticism number one. The social contract is a fiction, exclamation mark. The social contract is a fiction. Now, what is meant by this is that in fact, the social contract never actually took place. Let's think about it this way. I'll talk about myself. I never lived in a natural condition. I happen to be born into the United States of America. So I was never in a natural condition at any time in my life. So I'm a member of the United States. I'm a citizen of the United States, I suppose. But I was never in a natural condition. And I don't think anybody who's listening to this video ever lived in a true natural condition. Most of my 
students, my listeners to this video, are people who grew up in some kind of a government or state which was ruled by a government. Okay, so we've never lived in a natural condition. So there never was a single time when I or you decided, hey, this natural condition is really terrible. We need to get out of it somehow. We never did that. So I never gave away any of my natural rights. I never at any time decided to say, you know what, this sucks. I want to get out of the natural condition. Let's all sit around a campfire and smoke a peace pipe and decide to give up our natural rights, or at least some of them, to a ruler. Let's all agree to abide by the rule of don't do unto others as you would not want them to do unto you. We never actually agreed to that. So the social contract is a fiction. It's something that never actually happened. And so therefore, it cannot bind me. I cannot be bound by an agreement that I never made. And no one in this room, no one who's listening to this video, ever agreed to abide by the rules of the first and second natural law or to give up any of their rights to the government. Therefore, we cannot be bound by a, by a contract that we did not actually make. And so therefore, the social contract cannot be the basis of our obligation to obey anything whatsoever, whether it's the law of the land or whether it's the first and second natural law. So that's the criticism that the social contract is a fiction. It never happened as a historical fact. Therefore, it cannot be the basis of any obligations which we might have. Now, let's talk about some possible responses to this criticism, okay? I gave you one criticism, and we'll talk about a couple of responses, and we can sort of think through together whether the responses actually work. So, Here's one possible response to the criticism that we just gave. The social contract did happen a long time ago. What this is saying is that, okay, even though I and you listening to this video never actually sat around a campfire and decided to escape the natural condition, nevertheless, Surely sometime in the past, many, many years ago perhaps, there was a time when human beings were in a natural condition and they got fed up with it and they decided to actually contract away some of their natural rights and to abide by certain rules and to impose a government upon themselves. So this response is saying that, well, it's not a fiction. It did happen. It just happened a long time ago. Okay, uh, I personally don't think that that response is very good for two reasons. One is, I don't even think that's true. How can you establish that there was a time a long time ago when a bunch of people got around a campfire and decided to give up their natural rights? It just doesn't sound historically accurate. Uh, the way human beings have evolved over the centuries, if they were living in a natural condition at some time, I doubt very much that there was actually a time when humans anywhere, well, maybe it happened once or twice somewhere in some places in the world, but I doubt very much that as a general rule, all human beings are somehow descendant from a group of people who did live in a natural condition and then made a conscious decision to get out of it and impose upon themselves a ruler. So 
problem with this response is it's probably false, uh, at least if we're talking about most human beings living in most places. A second problem is that how can, even if this is true, let's suppose that there was a time, a long time ago, when human beings lived together in a natural condition and they decided to engage in a social contract. Even if that is true, I don't see exactly how that can bind me. If my parents, well, it wasn't my parents, my great, 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 grand, grand, grandparents of a long time ago decided to engage in a social contract and give up some of their rights, I don't see how that can bind me or you to obey the same agreement that those people made. So you can think about that, whether commitments made by a, a great-great-grandparent can somehow bind a great-great-grandchild to obey some commitment that that great-grandparent or great-great-grandparent made. So anyway, that's possible response number one. Uh, let's try another possible response that says as follows. This would be response number two. Response number two is going to admit that indeed the social contract, as a matter of historical fact, never took place. But this response says, we can call it the as if response, if you want to give it a little tag name, as if the social contract is hypothetical. Hypothetical means that, yes, it didn't actually take place, but it's as if it did take place. In other words, what Hobbes is saying is something like this. Look, right now we're not in a natural condition. But if we were in a natural condition, then we would want to get out of it. True, okay? If we were in a natural condition, then we would want to get out of it, and it would be rational for us to get out of it in the way that Hobbes describes. And so therefore, it is as if we have made a social contract. Um, it's not a historical fact. You never actually did it. I never actually did it. Our great-grandparents maybe never did it. Maybe they somehow evolved out of a natural condition into a state of uh, government or into a, a, a situation where they are ruled by rulers and they follow certain rules. It doesn't matter how that happened in fact. The bottom line is that if we were in a natural condition, then we would want to get out of it in the way that has been described. And therefore, it is binding upon us. That is the uh, as-if response. Another way of looking at the as-if response is to say something a little, I guess it's like kind of a, a variation on the same response to the criticism. Remember, the criticism is the social contract never actually happened, so how can we be bound by an agreement that we actually never made? So. What we're saying here so far is that, well, if we were in a natural condition, we would want to get out of it. And so therefore, uh, it is as if we have made that agreement. I still find that a little bit, it's missing something, right? Because, well, it, it, yeah, if we were in that situation, we would want to do X, Y, or Z, but we were never in that situation. We never actually made the agreement. So uh, how does this really answer the question? So. To add a little bit more to this response, Hobbes might say something like this, that right now we're in a, uh, a body politic. We are in a state where there's rules, there's regulations, there's government, etc. There's peace and security, relatively speaking. Okay, right now we know 
that if we don't keep up our commitment to the social contract, or if we don't keep up our commitment to abide by certain rules, the ones that Hobbes thinks he's identified as the rules that we should obey, if we don't keep up with that obedience, we are going to descend into a natural condition situation. And so therefore, right now, it's rational for us to obey the social contract or to agree to abide by the rules, the basic rules, the first and second natural law, and obedience to our government. Right now, it's rational for us to do that because if we don't do that, we are going to descend into a natural condition and we don't want that to happen. So therefore, even though we haven't actually signed on a dotted line somewhere and said, I hereby agree to abide by the first and second natural law, even though we haven't actually done that, it's rational for us to behave in that way. Okay, so I think this, this sounds a little bit more plausible as a good response. Uh, the critic is going to come back and say, as if is not an agreement, okay? Uh, and I don't want to tell you which side you should agree with here. Uh, I can feel that some people are going to agree with the criticism and some people are going to find the uh, answer satisfactory. If you choose to do your second paper on Thomas Hobbes, this is something you might discuss. Uh, what do you think? Do you think that this is a good response to the criticism? Okay, so um, maybe that's enough on criticism number one. So if, I guess, let me just summarize so far. Criticism number one was the social contract is a fiction. It never happened. So how can we be bound by an agreement that we actually never made? A possible answer is our ancestors made it a long time ago and somehow that binds us. A second possible answer is that it never actually happened. There never was a time when people actually engaged in a social contract, but it's rational for us to conduct ourselves as if we have made this agreement because um, we wouldn't want to be in a state of nature. And we also know that if we don't continue to abide by the rules, we're going to descend into a natural condition and that would be bad. So that's a little summary of, discuss of criticism number one and a couple of responses to the criticism. Let's move on and talk about criticism number two. Criticism number two is known as the free rider problem. Okay, the free rider problem. What is the free rider? I did not make this term up. This is a term that's used by philosophers to talk about a certain situation or a certain problem. Okay, a free rider is someone who wants to take a free ride. So let me give you an example of this uh, from my own youth. Uh, in New York City, where I grew up, there is a subway system. And this subway system is uh, a very, very elaborate system in which once you get into the subway, you can go anywhere in the city using the subway system. Now. When you go into the subway, you are supposed to pay a fare. Okay, so basically the reason why people uh, have to pay a fare is because obviously the subway has to be supported. There has to be money that will support the subways and the people who run the subways, etc. So it makes sense that everyone should be paying uh, a fare, whatever that fare might be, in order to support the subway system. Now, 
let's suppose that I have figured out a way to slip into the subway system, slip through the turnstile without paying my fare. Okay? So I'm in a position now where I can take a free ride. Okay? Let's suppose I can do that and I can do it very uh, subtly and very quickly and the chances of my getting caught are virtually zero because I figured out how, a way of slipping past the turnstile without paying my fare. Okay, so I can take a free ride. Now, you might say that's selfish, that's immoral, whatever, but the fact is I am in the position where I'm able to take a free ride. Now, let's suppose someone finds out about this, one of my friends finds out about this, and my friend says, you know, I was thinking about what you're doing and kind of reminds me of Hobbes' social contract theory. You know, look, if everybody were to do what you did, let's suppose everybody were to not pay their fare, okay? Let's suppose everybody were to slip through the turnstile then right away the subway would close down very quickly, right? They would say, hey, if you guys are all just trying to slip through and take the subway for free, we're not going to be able to run the subway, so we're going to close the subway down. So the fact that the subway is running and my ability to take advantage of the subway system depends on the fact that people are paying their fare, right? So someone might give me an argument that, look, you have a reason to pay your fare. The reason you should pay your fare is because if everybody didn't pay their fare, then the subway system would collapse and no one would be able to use it, including you. So therefore, you ought to pay your fare. So I might say, well, that's not a very convincing argument to me because, look, I want the subway to run. I need the subway to run. I'm happy that the subway is running and I am taking advantage. But as long as enough people are paying their fare, I really don't have a reason to abide by that rule of pay your fare if I know I can get away with it and still ride the subway. Okay. Let's think of another example of a, um, a free loader, okay? Free rider, free loader. Uh, let's suppose someone is uh, in a hotel and they find out that there's a very elaborate, wonderful wedding going on with lots and lots of food and lots and lots of drinks downstairs in the ballroom. So I wasn't invited and um, I don't know the bride or the groom, but I'm hungry, and if I can figure out a way of sneaking into the ballroom, making believe that I am a guest, and getting a meal and some drinks, well then, from my own personal self-interested point of view, I really don't have any reason not to do that. Now, someone might say, but wait, if everybody did that, let's suppose everybody in the hotel decided that they're gonna crash the wedding. Well then, you know, they would call the police and they would stop the wedding and they would pay, you know, make sure that everyone who's coming into the wedding really belongs there. Where's your invitation? They would start asking questions. So if everybody were to do this, then I wouldn't be able to do it. But as long as enough other people are not trying to cheat the system or take advantage, then I can take advantage even though I really am in some way not paying my dues that allow the system to work, okay? You could say the same thing about paying taxes. Let's suppose I figured out a way of not paying my taxes every year. Well, if everybody were to do that, the whole government would collapse. There would be no police. There would be no firemen. There would be no public uh, schools. Well, uh, that, I wouldn't want that result to happen, right? But as long as enough other people are paying their taxes, all of those uh, institutions are going to be functioning. Okay, now how does this apply as a criticism against Hobbes? Okay, again, this is called the free rider problem, and think of the image of that person who is taking advantage of a situation 
where if he know where he knows that if everybody were to do what he's doing, then nobody would be able to do what he's doing, and he would be out as well. So uh, how does this apply to Hobbes? Well, it seems like this is Hobbes's theory, right? Hobbes's theory is that we are all self-interested creatures. We are all self-interested beings. Basically, what we do is self-interest. Okay. Um, we might have some altruistic occasions in life, but basically the reason why we are giving up, according to Hobbes, the reason why we're giving up some of our natural rights is because we don't want to live in a natural condition. I don't want to live in a natural condition, and therefore Hobbes claims that I should be contracting away some of my natural rights. Okay. But let's suppose I'm going to think like a free rider. I'm going to say to myself like this. Look, as long as enough other people are giving up their natural rights, or at least some of them, as long as enough other people are, so to speak, paying their fare, okay, then I'm going to be living in a peaceful society. So therefore, as an individual, from a strictly self-interested point of view, I don't have a good reason for giving up any of my natural rights so long as I feel like I can get away with it. If enough people in the world or enough people in my immediate social sphere are obeying the laws of society and they're not doing unto others what they would not want others to do to them, if enough people are behaving like that, we are out of a natural condition. So therefore, I, as an individual, don't have any reason from a self-interested point of view to agree to abide by any rules. And so therefore, it looks like Hobbes' theory leaves out the free rider. Why should he, if the only reason for engaging in the social contract is to escape the state of nature and we have escaped the state of nature because enough other people are, I don't know, maybe they're just dumb enough or whatever their reasons are, they've engaged in the natural, uh, in the social contract, um, then I don't really have a good motivation for abiding by any of the rules so long as I can get away with it. Um, to put a little more polish on this criticism, we could say that uh, put it maybe in a more technical, fancy way, what we have here is a conflict between what is rational for the group as a whole versus what is rational for an individual within that group. This happens sometimes in life, where what's rational for the group to do may not necessarily be rational for the individual to do if he sees himself as uh, not part of the group. I mean, even if he sees himself as a member of this bunch of people, he can still, what's, what's, what's rational for him to do may be different than what's rational for most people to do. As long as most people are abiding by the rules, again, think of my example with, this, with the subway fare, as long as most people are abiding by the rules of society, and not stealing and not cheating and not doing nasty things to other people, I'm out of the state of nature. I don't have a motivation or a reason for giving up, for contracting away any of my natural rights. So that, in summary, is the free rider problem. Now, let's think about a couple of possible answers. How might Hobbes answer the free rider problem. So one possible answer is for him to say that um, you're not thinking rationally. You really aren't thinking rationally because again, if everybody were to think like you and do as you do, the system would collapse and you'd be back in a natural condition. Uh, to me, that doesn't seem like a complete answer. It seems like 
uh, it's not rational. That's precisely the problem. As long as enough other people are abiding by the rules, it is not rational from a self-interest point of view to uh, give up any of my natural rights and obey any rules. So another possibility, another possible response is that Hobbes might say, that's why I told you, that's why it's part of my theory that the contract only works if there is a government that's going to impose punishments for people who try to be free riders, okay? In other words, Hobbes might say something like this, look, most people are gonna go along with this. Remember that first natural law is seek peace, compromise, don't shoot first, rather ask questions and then shoot if you need to. Really, that first natural law is kind of a reverse of the law of the jungle. Remember the law of the jungle was sh shoot first, ask questions later? In a way, the first natural law reverses that and says, um, seek peace, try to be friendly and nice, that should be your first attempt and only then, as a fallback, use all means of war at your disposal. So most people, yes, there are going to be some free riders. Hobbes recognizes that. Sure, there are going to be people who try to cheat the system. There are going to be people who try to get through the turnstile for free. But most people, they're going to be, hey, what can I do to help really get out of the natural condition? I don't want to live in a natural condition. What can I do to get out of the natural condition? I can do my little part by agreeing to abide by the rules. Yes, I know I can get away with it, at least a lot of times, but most people are going to be rational enough to realize that this is, this makes sense. And so, in addition, what we're gonna do is have harsh punishments. Okay, so this again, I think, is part of Hobbes's answer to the free brighter problem. He's going to say, "Look, um, I know there are going to be some free riders out there. They're going to think this way, and in a way, they're in some sense they're right, but they're definitely wrong if everybody were to act that way. Right? We know that if everybody were to act that way, the system would collapse. They would be in trouble. Okay, so therefore, Hobbes says." We're going to impose upon ourselves a government, and that government is going to have the right to impose severe punishments for those who are free riders. So, for example, suppose that the penalty for jumping the turnstile in the subway was that you get your legs cut off. That sounds a bit harsh, and I think it is. Okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Suppose the punishment for jumping the turnstile was you are permanently banned forever from using the subway. Suppose the punishment for jumping the turnstile is 10 years in prison. Okay, well then, from your own selfish, interested point of view, you would then have a reason for not jumping the turnstile. Okay, so the basic idea is that Again, this is, I'm saying, this is how Hobbes might respond to the free rider problem. He might say, look, most people are going to be rational and they're going to be willing as a group. There is such a thing as group behavior. As a group, most people are going to be willing to give up some of their natural rights and to abide by the rules of don't do unto others as you would not want them to do unto you and to obey the law of the land and to respect the government. Most people are going to be rational enough to do that. For those who are free riders, that's why we have the harsh penalties to keep those people in line. So that's what Hobbes might say in response to the free rider. And you can think about whether you agree with the criticism or you agree more with Hobbes's possible responses to the free rider problem. And I'm going to go on to criticism number three.
Now, criticism number three is a bit more complicated and uh, I hope not too confusing, but it's definitely a bit more complicated and subtle than the previous two criticisms. This criticism, to give it a label, is that there is a contradiction within Hobbes's there is a contradiction within Hobbes's theory of natural rights okay a contradiction is of course there's something that doesn't make sense internally in effect uh, this criticism is going to say that there's something that Hobbes says in one place that doesn't fit with something he says in another place. Both of them can't be true, yet both of them are essential to having his theory work. So there's an internal contradiction within Hobbes' theory of specifically natural rights. Let's go back to the idea of a natural right. Remember that Hobbes says that in the natural condition, we have certain natural rights. Now, what exactly is a right? So it turns out that if you think about the idea of a right, there's really two different possibilities regarding what a right is. This is where things get a little complicated, but Try to stay with me here. When we talk about a right, we could mean I'm using the word right as a noun, a right. I've got, I have a right. Uh, as opposed to using the word right as an adjective, which we sometimes do. Oh, that was a right, a right thing to do, okay? We're talking about a right as a noun. Now, there's two possibilities, okay? A right could mean what philosophers sometimes call a brute power. Brute power. Hope you can see that. All right, a brute power. In other words, um, for example, uh, right now, I have the power, I have a natural power to start screaming obscenities at the top of my lungs. Especially because this is a video that's public, I'm not going to exercise that natural power that I have. And I really don't want to do that, but I happen to have lots of a brute, the, the word brute here sim, simply means like a raw power, just a natural power that I have. It's just part of my nature. Um, you know, I have a brute power. I have the ability to start um, jumping up and down and uh, yelling at the top of my lungs. <laughs> See, well, I just did that. Okay, well, I wasn't doing the jumping. Anyway, I have a brute power, a raw power, to do various things, okay? That's one possibility of what a right could mean. Uh, however, uh, there's another possibility, and in a way, a more likely possibility about what a right is, is a right is an entitlement of some sort an entitlement. Okay, what do I mean by an entitlement? Uh, an entitlement means something that it's not just a power that I have, but it's something that I not only have the power to do it, but other people have a duty to in some way respect my power to do that thing. Other people have a duty, a moral obligation, or an obligation of some sort to um, 
uh, act in such a way to show that they acknowledge that I have not just the power to do that thing, but the entitlement. So for example, we talk about having you know, a title to a car, right? If you have uh, a title to a car, that, ju that doesn't mean that you just have the car in your backyard and you have the brute power of getting into it and driving it around. If you have the title to your car, that means you own it. And it means that other people have the duty to respect that ownership that you have. So entitlement, philosophers would say that entitlement is a moral notion, or we might say another term to use here is a normative. Okay, I don't know if this is a word I've used before in this class. This is the word normative. A normative notion uh, is a notion which involves duties and obligations or implies duties and obligations for some people. So, for example, um, a brute power is not a normative notion. We would say, philosophers would say that a brute power is a descriptive. A brute power is a descriptive notion. A descriptive notion means it just describes a fact. You know, this is just a plain, simple fact of nature that human beings have the ability to jump up and down and scream at the top of their lungs. Okay? Um, if I say something like, um, John murdered someone, I, I, I would be describing what that person did. They killed someone. If I said something like, what John did was bad, if I say John did something wrong, I'm making an evaluation. I'm not merely describing what they did. I'm judging the moral quality or I'm judging the action and I'm saying they should not have done what they did. So a descriptive term is one which we use to just describe the way the world is. A normative term is one where we use that term to make some kind of implication about what people should or shouldn't do, okay? So for example, uh, if I say, um, I have the right of free speech, let's just flip to, you know, in the United States, we have something, it's a legal right, we have something called the right of free speech. Um, that's enshrined in the Constitution. Okay, so the right of free speech is a normative notion, it would seem, right? Because it's not just saying that people have the ability to speak freely. It's saying that people not only have the ability to speak freely, but somehow others, the government included, are supposed to respect and allow that power to be exercised now, there might be limits. There are limits to the right of free speech, right? You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Uh, you can't just uh, yell anything you want anywhere at any time. So the right of free speech is limited, but there is this notion of the right of free speech. The right of free speech is somehow an entitlement. It's not simply uh, something that we are able to do. Okay, so let's go back now to the situation with Hobbes. Hobbes says that we have rights in the natural condition. And the problem is, in a way, that we have too much, too many rights in the natural condition. Everybody has natural rights, and that's and so that that creates a situation where there's each individual has too much power and freedom to do whatever the hell they want to do. That's what's so bad about the natural condition. But he describes a right as a liberty or a power. Now, what does he mean? Does he mean that in the natural condition, we just have powers to do whatever we feel we need to do to survive and to promote our own self-interest? Or does he mean that we have a right in the sense of a moral notion that we have an entitlement that somehow in the natural condition we are entitled to pursue our own self-interest and to pursue our own self-preservation 
Which of these two does he mean? Now, the fact that it's not so clear what he means is not necessarily a criticism, but I'm going to try to show you that whichever way you go, there's going to be a problem. Okay, let's suppose that what Hobbes means is that in the natural condition, we have an entitlement. Let's, let's start with that option. Perhaps what Hobbes is saying is that in the natural condition, we have certain rights, we are entitled to pursue our own self-interest, we are entitled to do whatever we feel we need to do in order to advance our self-interest and to promote our life and our own well-being. Okay, so if we have entitlements in the natural condition, well, that's a moral notion. If we have entitlements, that means that other people have the obligation to obey, to respect those rights. And that would mean that morality already exists in the natural condition. Because if I have an entitlement in the natural condition, that implies that you have the obligation or other people have the obligation to in some way respect that right and that would mean that morality already exists in the natural condition before we made the social contract. So we would have not only rights, but we, we would have obligations and duties in the natural condition. Yet Hobbes' whole theory, at least the way I've understood it and tried to explain it, Hobbes' theory is that ethics is created through the social contract. Well, if ethics is created through the social contract, in the natural condition, Hobbes says, anything goes. In fact, Hobbes says, and I probably should have said this earlier, um, but Hobbes says that in the natural condition, there's no such thing as justice or injustice. Because in the natural condition, everything is fair, nothing is foul. I did say more or less uh, exactly that. But there is a, there's a, a passage where Hobbes says that in the natural condition, there's no such thing as justice or injustice because in the natural condition, it's basically a free-for-all. Anybody can do whatever the hell they want to do. So here's the contradiction over there is if Hobbes says that we have entitlements in the natural condition, then he'd be committed to saying that there are duties and obligations and therefore that there, there should be justice and injustice in the natural condition. Yes, it would be a very, very messy kind of situation to live in. We're not denying that. The criticism is not that he's wrong about his discussion of the natural condition in terms of how awful it would be. It would be awful, let's suppose. But if you say that we have entitlements in the natural condition, then you are already saying that justice and injustice pre-exists the social contract. So, he can't mean that we have entitlements in the natural condition. So let's try the other option. Perhaps what Hobbes meant to say is, ah, he's saying like this, in the natural condition, we have certain brute powers. We have a liberty or a freedom, a natural freedom that uh, we find within ourselves to do whatever we feel we need to do to advance our interests and promote our own self-preservation. So perhaps that's what he means. We have these brute powers in the natural condition. Um, and then we realize that, hey, there's too much power here. We need to restrict ourselves in some way. Okay, the problem is, if Hobbes is saying that, he also wants to say that we transfer some of our natural rights to the government, that we give up and somehow we authorize the government to rule over us by transferring some of our rights to the ruler. Well, here's the problem. If by a natural right is meant a brute power, that is something that is not transferable. Think about this. An entitlement is something you can transfer. For example, uh, maybe not all entitlements, but Again, I'll use the example of, suppose you have a title to your car. You own a car. 
So you have a claim to your car that it is yours, it's in your name. You can then decide to transfer that car to someone else. Excuse me a second. A little background noise, someone's using a printer here. 